Are you recording? Okay. Hello, my name is Kim. You are listening to Unsolved Mysteries Rewind. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Mark. Mark, how are you? <laughs> yeah, we're talking about season nine, episode eight. Hmm. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but there are so many moving parts to this episode. Like three of the five stories have tributaries of other stories in them. So uh, why do you say we just jump right in? All right, well, we are talking about 4th of July, 1988, and five-year-old Chase Bowman is basically triggered by the fireworks going on outside, um, which is not totally uncommon, especially with children. His... Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. no but i she instantly lost credibility with me as soon as i saw that she was kind of like trying to hawk her book on here <laughs> yeah and so this book actually did come out in 1997 and so in 88 is when he was triggered Right, but she, it did coincide perfectly with the episode of Unsolved Mystery. So, you know, she was trying to sell some copies. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. And apparently this turned into like a huge phobia for Chase. He did not like loud noises, fireworks, anything like that. So she starts digging a little deeper and she takes him to a hypnotherapist. And all of a sudden he's like, I am an African-American soldier and I am in the Civil War. Um, I, he says he gets hit by like bullets. So he gets transported to this little makeshift triage area. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And we get a reenactment a little later on with like a three-year-old talking about some dark stuff and she's just smiling the whole time. It was so creepy. I love her. Yeah, it's like, you don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> yeah. And they're so, like, fresh and pure and unjaded and new. Like, I feel like the memory is just, like, newer with them. Um so when he gets transported to this little triage in his past life, they bandage him up and they send him right back out to go man a cannon. And he was right behind the cannon when he sees this big like flash and that's it. So that's how he died. And the mom says, you know, I monitor what he watches and he has no frame of reference for like the American Civil War. He doesn't know what this is. Good cue. Good cue. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems suggestive sometimes, and it seems like it can put ideas in your head. But they did say that it was like the mom's friend, so maybe the friend suggested it. I have no idea. <laughs> Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they have him draw what the triage area looked like and what the cannon looked like. And then we cut to, quote unquote, uh, he's a quote unquote Civil War historian, which just means he is one of these weird Civil War reenactors. Yeah. Um, that is so dorky though like i <laughs> and i'm pretty dorky myself but that is such a turn off like when i saw him with the whole outfit on regalia and everything and i go i facebook stalked him and he's still doing some war reenactments to this day yeah yeah I mean, bless, you're doing, you got one life to live. Do what makes you happy. But it's, it is not for me, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Ugh, no, I couldn't bear it. I get such secondhand embarrassment. It would be unbearable for me. But the mom, oh, yeah. I think, oh, my God, maybe it's my past life. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think I could either. I, it went away in my adulthood, but it kind of came back a little later. So when I was a two or three year old kid, like I could not handle airplanes. Airplanes used to scare me so much in the sky because I thought they were going to fall out of the sky. So my mom forced me to wear a hat everywhere I went so that the brim of the hat would like I so I couldn't see the airplanes. And I was totally fine after that. But I would freak out. And my mom was like, I have no idea where this is coming from, because how do you know, like, that's not supposed to be up in the sky and maybe it'll come down. So that was like a huge fear I had for a long time. I still, I will not go on an airplane. I can't handle it. I will take a bus. Yes. I hate it. I hate it. I, we flew here. We flew from Oregon where we were living to Florida to go visit my husband's family like five years ago. And I had a full blown panic attack. And I told him, I was like, this is the last time I am flying. I will never get on an airplane again. No sorry. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oof, yeah. Seriously. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. No, definitely. Oof, I hate that feeling too. I don't love going over bridges, but it's not quite that bad. But was that a, like ever since you were a kid? Hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, maybe you are similar to little two-year-old Leah Letter. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> well, when she's two and a half, she is in the back seat and her mom's driving her home and she goes, Mommy, this is just like where I died. And the mom's like, excuse me, sorry, what? And she's like, yeah, I crashed my car and this is where I died. And so the mom's like, where was mommy during all this? And she's like, no, you weren't here yet. I was an adult. My feet could reach the pedals. I was driving over the bridge. I crashed, came out of the car, fell into the water. I hit my head on a rock and I could see the bubbles going up. Uh, like as she's taking her last breaths and she goes, and that's when I died. And she's just smiling. It's just so creepy. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, maybe he's fresh. He's a new one. <laughs> You don't. It happened. Like, that's what I think. In the other kid that we talked about, Chase, he's five. He's a little older. He's had a little more experience. Uh, you know, loud noises scare. He's getting his own idiosyncrasies. But this little girl is like so matter of fact in the way she's talking it is so creepy. And then, you know, we briefly kind of talked to Colleen and Blake Hawken. And just basically when Blake was three, he's like, my ear hurts. A man hit me with a truck. And she goes, the reenactor goes, you were outside and a man hit you? Like she is grilling this kid. Yeah, and he's like, no, not here. Before, like, I met you, I was driving, and some guy ran over me, and, and that's when I died. And so we meet this guy, Barry Beierstein, who has since passed away, but he just says, like, yeah, kids are creative, and they like to fantasize, obviously. Like, that's probably the most likely explanation. Mm-hmm. Oh, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Well, in due time, in due time. Yeah. Uh, well, now we get to move on to more feel-good story. We got uh, pet heroes. Yay. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I cried. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what was going on with me, but I definitely shed a tear when I saw Boo, like, swimming out in the pond or whatever, the river. Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah. I think one of my dogs would do what Oscar does a little later on, but I don't think the rest of them would even blink like if something happened to me. And so, yeah. And they hate our river because that's how we bathe them. We bathe them in the river. So they hate going to the river. So they definitely wouldn't go swimming out for me. But we have Lillian McDermott and she's taking her little dog, Boo. Little dog. That was a big old dog. Um, and like half a mile upstream, there is a deaf and mute amateur prospector named Link Hill. And he was going, he was just dredging the water for gold and he had gone to fetch a gas can and Link falls in the river and he gets swept downstream. And this is like a swift moving river. So Boos. Yeah. Yeah, it was a not nowadays. Like that was really odd. But Boo sees him and he swims out to Link. Link's like, you know, flailing. He can't scream or anything, but he's just flailing. And he Boo grabs Link by the arm and pulls him back to safety. I 
I know. And and Beatrice Leidecker, who is an animal communicator, said that she, Boo probably picked up on like the fear that Link was emitting. Um, and then we meet animal behaviorist Susan Hess, who says, well, he's a Newfoundland, and that's what they do. They do water rescues. So, womp womp. <laughs> um okay this is very embarrassing and i can't believe i'm going to admit this publicly but my dog sophie who i'm like obsessed with who's my emotional support animal whatever you know from when i was sick we for her birthday got like an animal psychic to talk to us i can't believe i'm admitting this but this psychic thank you i i feel like i'm sharing a lot but this no yeah like she told us stuff and i know everybody says it but she told us stuff that she would have no way of knowing unless she was communicating with our dog like it was such an emotional experience to have with her i was bawling my little eyes out like she we had this one experience where we thought that our dog killed two of our chickens but, and because she was in the backyard anyway long story short she told us like that dog didn't kill the chickens but we never even brought that up she goes like oh sophie's showing me two chickens she wants you guys to know that she didn't hurt them she never would hurt them and she had no way of knowing that and we were wondering it was either her or it was going to be a fox like we knew it was one or the other and then we had a fox come in later so now we think it was the fox because our dog like put out into the universe like it wasn't me like I, i'm a good dog oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. For sure, for sure. And we, like, felt, like, as soon as she said that, Sophie's whole body relaxed. Like, Sophie was like, oh, my God, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Yes, 100%. She was, like, she started panting, She but she, like, laid down and stuff. She was like, oh, thank God I got that over with. And this this chicken incident happened, like, two years before. It was just crazy. But, uh, sorry, enough about me. I know we got a lot to cover today. <laughs> no. Um, but... Yeah, so Dr. Chris Eisenberg, is, or Eschenberg, excuse me, is coming home from work late at night, and it's really, really quiet out. And he's like, mm, that's weird, because his dog, Oscar, usually, like, would bark and freak out, you know, be so excited when Chris came home. So all of a sudden, this man, like, pops out of the bushes and holds a gun on Chris, and he's like, don't say anything, we're just going to go into your house. So Chris is like, oh, God, my dog Oscar loves people. Like, Oscar's just going to be putty in this guy's hands. Um, and so he goes inside. Oscar's nowhere to be seen. And then, bam, Oscar, like, just starts biting the crap out of this guy, and the bad guy. And the guy ends up, like, pistol whipping the doctor in the head. And he conks out for a second. So he comes back to and he hears like the gate closing with the bad guy running off. And he looks at Oscar and Oscar is like drenched in blood. And he's like, oh, my God, what happened? He cleans them all up. And Oscar wasn't even hurt. It was the other guy's blood. So the. Yeah, he and it it's not a dog that you would think of going banana. Like, it's not like a pit bull. It's not like a German shepherd. It, this was like. Yeah, this was like, he wasn't a Labrador, but he was adjacent. A poodle. I don't, off the top of my head, I heard it just this morning. I was like, I should write that down, and I didn't. Oh, 
I'm sure he's he's not. I mean, he'd be very old. Yeah, exactly. But he won the Ken L. Ration Dog Hero of the Year Award. Oh, no, sorry. He was Miss Congeniality. He actually was second place. Um, yeah, I couldn't find who the first place was, but oh, well, what can you do? So, yeah, we love you, Oscar. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, enough about these dogs. Ringo. Ringo. <laughs> so we're in Bowling Green, Ohio, and we meet Dr. Ray and Carol Steiner. And they're both homebound. They're a lot older. And Ray had just had heart surgery. And Carol had what they refer to in Unsolved Mysteries as a foot ailment, which sounds disgusting. But it was actually an injury from a car accident. And her leg was like all, all braced up and everything. Yeah, they both were. It seems like the, <laughs> well, it seems like the most they could do is pretty much get up to open the sliding glass door and let Ringo out. But they had both been suffering from like memory loss, high blood pressure, chronic fatigue. And suddenly in August, this cat just starts like going bananas. He will like run and body slam the door. And they're like, what's going on? He just makes as much noise as possible. So she goes and opens the door to let the cat out. And he will like run around the corner and then he'll run back inside and he'll be like, hello, like, follow me, you know, come with me. So the woman leaves to go with him and he starts digging up the garden. He's just digging, digging, digging. He's on this sole mission. He starts sniffing like something smells gross. And so Carol sniffs it and she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> it was so cute. <laughs> Yeah, so Carol sniffs it, and she's like, this smells like gas. So she tries to go get Ray up and out of the house because this whole place is like a tinderbox, and he's unconscious, and she cannot wake him. So they call the gas company, who takes a reading and says that it's at such high explosive levels that a spark, they said, could blow the whole neighborhood, which could potentially kill 22 people. <laughs> yeah this place is gonna blow so they call it well right where he was digging right where Ringo was de digging there's this huge tear in the gas line yeah and so the Humane Society gives Ringo the William O. Stillman award for bravery and it's very cute like we get a picture of him with like a little hero badge yeah <laughs> Good boy. I would say almost everything besides the physical ailments, like the memory loss and all that stuff is definitely, they said they were at like a huge risk for as asphyxiation. Uh-oh. Mm. I mean, Ringo got the job done. Oh, that's true. No. <laughs> it was cute. Mm hmm Yeah, he was, he, he earned it. Definitely. And now we come to what I think is your biggest phobia of the episode. Whoa. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Don't kip, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, great gift for mom. Yeah, it's like cook me some dinner or like you need improvement. Mm 
<laughs> yeah. Crazy. Mm hmm. Yes. No, it did. It shot in three because there was one in the wall, too, but two of them hit her. Mm hmm. Oof. Yeah, it is really crazy. And if you guys want to learn more about the this story in particular, there's a website called Hayridge that has an article called The Bad Old Days that goes into excruciating detail about these stories. And it is just a really interesting read. Yeah, and then it said Howard, her husband, Craig, her son, and Doreen, her daughter, will be next. But I've also seen it where the note says, Howard, you're dead, first Joan, then Craig, and Doreen, which is a big difference. Um, but either way, uh, sadly, she did die in the hospital that evening. And on Unsolved Mysteries, they say, you know, no one knows who killed her or why they would want to. But an interesting side note is that three months after she died her 28 year old son craig was actually charged with her death and handwriting on the pick on the package was similar to his known handwriting and a bomb sniffing dog detected his scent on the package so in june of 1983 charges were dropped because there just wasn't enough evidence and police say that he was very knowledgeable in wiring and electronics because he used to work with doing electronics and wiring on like naval ships through his dad's business and that his dad had recently fired him. So they think that Howard, the dad, was the target of the son. And Howard says, no, like my son's innocent. He wasn't fired. He actually quit. But Howard says that he thinks either a student or a disgruntled parent would want to quote pull a prank on her and give her a scare but they weren't meaning to kill her the other thing that i think is interesting to mention is that she was in the middle of a campaign to be the vice president of the board of education and she was expected to win so just saying that could also be a place to find some motive yeah Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm <laughs> Right. I know. And that that is definite motive to me. And I never saw anywhere mentioned where they investigated anybody even involved with that. But basically, it's pretty quiet until over a decade later in October of 1993, um, a retired New York sanitation worker and his wife are on vacation in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and he's just, like, giving her crap about donating to charity. <laughs> she's like, he's like, I told you to stop donating to these charities. And she's like, oh, I'll, I'll write a check to the ones I like. So the children come and visit, and they bring the mail from the westerly neighborhood of Staten Island where they lived. 
they brought their mail because they're on vacation in Pennsylvania. Well, they open it up and it's like a commemorative medallion from a charity organization. So as soon as he opens it up, it shoots again, three bullets going in three different directions. So one hit him, one hit his wife and one hit their granddaughter, Liza. And there have been three more attacks since, which is a total of five. And they all happened in New York. So Robert Sack tells us, you know, each package contains a lethal homemade weapons that fires three bullets in three different directions. So you're pretty much guaranteed to get hit by this thing. Oh my God. I get Amazon prime like every day almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it'll be like handwritten and stuff. And and we meet Gregory Radigan, who's like the hard boiled postal inspector for New York, and he says, If you ever get a package you don't know, call the person who sent it to you before you open it. Which how who's gonna do that? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was bonkers, though. But we, uh, you know, they, these... No, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the graphics are not on point because at 27 minutes and 43 seconds, you can clearly see that her baby bump is just like a pillow with a strap around it. And we'll post a picture on the Facebook page and Self Mysteries Rewind podcast on Facebook. And oh my God, it was so, I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, but. I have no idea, but oh my God, I was so worried for that baby because the, the mom is hit with shrapnel from each bullet, but the baby isn't hit, but the baby is in severe distress. She's eight months pregnant and the baby has to be delivered like right now. So she luckily has a happy, healthy baby girl. We get to see a little update of them. And she says, you know, if she had not opened the book on just a slight angle, she would be dead. Because that's the only reason why she got just little bits of the bullets. I'll bet. Yeah. So in Brooklyn, New York, and Bath Beach, uh, we have a 77-year-old re realtor who had a near miss when he opened up a rigged package which was addressed to his wife and it ended up going through like the walls and the windows but luckily nobody was hurt so uh, there have been no zip gun bomber packages since 1996 now there is a man who we will call steven who is a suspect in this case now joan kipp was one of his guidance counselors at the high school and police like busted in on him for whatever reason and they found that he was making similar bombs he was like hollowing out books and putting they call it a bomb but it's not it's a gun so he was in jail at the time of her death but they think maybe he, a friend on the outside kind of helped him with that no charges have ever been filed against him but here's my crazy theory is it possible i'm just saying is it possible i'm not accusing that maybe the son was involved in the first case and then the rest were a copycat because it took almost 11 years for another case to happen after Joan Kipp was killed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and please don't.
Definitely. Yeah, I don't know. I was asking Jack, my husband, I said, how does that even work? Like, I don't even understand this. And he said, I can draw you a picture if you want. And I said, please don't, because that'll be exhibit A if anything happens. Like, don't, don't. I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Wow. Mm hmm. Yeah. No. Gonorrhea, eye gauze. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 I got you. I got you. <laughs> well, this next story to me is like the meat and potatoes of this episode. This is what I'm about. So t we, I've read a lot of this article called A Deadly Passion by Brian Walston, which is so in-depth about this. So I got a lot of the information from there and I want to give credit where credit's due. But we start in City of Industry, California. It's kind of outside LA and this we're at the Sheridan Hotel. So on November 21st, 1996 is where we kind of meet up with Unsolved Mysteries and we see police using a dummy that they fashioned out of fire hose and they're dropping it off a balcony at a hotel. And we're like, OK, that's kind of weird. So on November 12th, just a few days beforehand, we meet Sandra Orlana, who falls 10 stories, which is 108 feet to her death on her 27th birthday. It's the second episode in a row where we had somebody die on their birthday. It's so sad. So um, earlier that day, she had actually arrived in on in California on a business trip with her boss, who is 33-year-old Robert Salazar. Um, so he, they work for Skillmaster, which is an employment agency. Like, I got a, the feeling it was kind of like a temp agency in Houston. Exactly. Exactly. Well, she is the she went with him because Skillmaster had recently acquired a company in California. And so they went together to go just kind of meet their new people. Um, she was the manager who oversaw workman's comp claims, but she originally started work as his assistant. And he is the general manager of all operations. So she is engaged to a man and he's married with two kids, young kids. He's got. He's been married for 16 months at this time, and they have an eight-month-old child. So we meet attorney Michael Seidel, who represents Sandra's family, and supposedly he had taken her along to interview for, like, a new high-level job at that company that they had just acquired. But on the morning of the 12th, they check into their adjoining rooms, and around 6.30 the next day on the 13th another hotel guest actually saw sandra's body and it was naked except for a camisole so when police get there they take her and they see that she has a blood alcohol content of 0.22 yeah so she'll be you know stumbling forgetful like it is they said like basically you, you could aspirate on your vomit at this point because your reflexes are all numb yeah i mean i know that they were out to dinner with the guy who they are acquiring everything from and they had a few drinks there and they're getting a little tipsy and then he the guy who they're acquiring everything from drops the two of them off at the hotel and they keep drinking at the hotel now i know she's five two she appears to be very slender so i would imagine it doesn't take much to get her there Oh, 0 0.08 here. Um, so, yeah, it's three times the legal limit. So, and, 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, they were drinking. And so police actually question Salazar as soon as they find her body. And he says, I took her to her room at midnight and I, I never saw her again after that. So we meet Lieutenant Raymond Peavy, who says, like, at first they believed him, but they noticed what looks like a scratch on his forehead and they found his underwear and one of his shoes inside her room. Yeah, so they question him again. They're like, hey, any idea how your underwear would show up in a room? And he goes, okay, you got me. Like, I went in the room. We had sex. We had some post-coital balcony fun times. And she just kind of like, woohoo, straddled the balcony. And that's when she fell off. And I was so scared that I just kind of ran back to my hotel room. And I prayed that it didn't actually happen. So I didn't get help. No. Oh, oh, heavens. No. Yeah, I know. And then here's the thing. The next morning he calls her multiple times and they're like, get down here, sleepyhead. Like what's taking you so long? Meanwhile, he knows that she fell 10 stories. So no, but maybe you should mention that. Yeah. It it didn't. It was like brick on the it was like cinder blocky type material, but the thing is it was like 1:30 in the morning, something like that. It was definitely well after midnight, but where this story takes a turn for the salacious is that everything I read said that they were actually having sex on the balcony. Yes. Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I could so see this happening. And in my version, granted, this is like a lot more uh, graphic than I would normally be with another married man. But <laughs> I'm just saying talking to you. But like in my mind, they were having sex on the balcony. She like from behind, she puts her knee up on the railing and maybe with some excited thrusting on his part, maybe she loses her gra her balance and go, you know, her center of gravity is shifted. Now, I also think the scratch on his forehead could be from someone who's falling, who's trying to grasp onto whatever she can get. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. But the, the family says, like, if they had sex, it was not consensual. Like, she was a good girl. I know. They always idolize their deceased loved one. <laughs> oh, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Now, there, I do too. No. no. Yeah. Here's the thing. I mostly agree with what you said. Now, by 2020 standards, I don't think that's consensual because if you have a blood alcohol content of 0.22, you know, maybe you're not putting up such much of a fight, but like, they try and introduce the fact that there's like blood on the sheets and blood on his clothing, her blood. But it turns out during trial, a criminologist testifies that it was actually her menstrual blood. 
So it's not like it was from an aggressive attack. And according to autopsy reports, there was no semen in or on her body. So I don't know why we didn't find the under the nail results if they even took them. But pol- yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm hmm. A hundred percent. Yeah. And like police think they, their theory is that she was passed out. He started raping her. She woke up and then they fought and then he just dragged her out to the balcony and threw her over, which I just don't personally see happening. I'm not saying, well, legally it didn't happen. So uh, apparently, according to her family, she had complained that he was making advances towards her and she was contemplating filing a sexual harassment suit, but she was afraid of the repercussions that that would have for her profession professionally. So Yeah, and we meet several witnesses who say that they were at the hotel bar, The Sandra and Robert were at the hotel bar, drinking, holding hands, dancing, kissing. He was caressing her cheek. Like, they looked like a couple. So they went up to Sandra's room, and we have another witness who said that they were, quote, strenuously exercising their mutual attraction. <laughs> um, but he says, and he also said, I thought they were going to have sex right there in the hallway. Like, they were just... You know, you can picture it just making out, you know, tearing the clothes off. They're drunk. They're at a hotel. Like, I can see this happening. So where you shouldn't go with this guy's path, because I do think it was an accident. He just pretends like nothing happened. Like, we, yeah. And then leaving the voicemails for her as if you think she's just sleeping it off. Like, you're crazy. They He... He tells his story about how he ran back and prayed that it didn't happen. Um, so Lieutenant PV says that when they're testing the dummy with the fire hose, his account, Salazar's account of what happened couldn't have happened because the dummy kept falling like 15 feet from where Sandra was found. And he says, you know, you'd have to like, woo, like really throw that thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's more realistic dummies we can use than just like a, a little fire hose person, too. Yeah. And. Yeah, I do, too. And he and like, I don't know, I think they're just trying to cinch their case because they really didn't have a whole lot of evidence on Robert. Now, Robert did a 48 hours interview. I couldn't find it, but he is sitting next to his wife who he was cheating on. And he says, oh, I was not attracted to Sandra. I mean, I was a married man. Like, I would never even look at another woman, you know, basically is what he's saying, which is crazy. Yeah, right next to your wife who, like, just had your baby, you know, after the... Uh, yeah. Exactly. And he says that she was facing the outside, not having sex, but she's just looking outside over the balcony, turns around naked, yeah, with just a camisole on, turns around to put her leg up on the balcony so she was facing him, and then she fell. Which, again, would kind of make sense of grasping. Um, so... Four days after the murder, he resigned at the request of the Scale Master Company, and he moved to this town in Louisiana. And oh, 10 minutes after the episode of Unsolved Mysteries originally aired, a man called the Telecenter, and he says, my name's Mike. I'm from Richmond, Indiana. My mother and I were strolling around the hotel. We heard an argument coming from above, so we looked up to the 10th floor, and I see a man grab a woman by the ankles and flip her off a balcony. I don't buy that. Why wouldn't you check on her, call the police? Like, 
it was so convenient. So there actually is a special missing segment to this episode of Unsolved Mysteries that only went in the Central Time Zone reruns where detectives are begging for Mike to come forward, but he has never come forward. So in November of 97, Sandra's family files a civil lawsuit against Salazar and Skillmaster, the company, saying that Salazar murdered Sandra and Skillmaster failed to remove an employee who quote, constituted a danger to the company's female employees. Really? Oh my gosh. Well, the whole time during the civil trial, he just pled the fifth, which is so annoying. But um, five years later, he was charged. I know, but you know, it just like, tell us the truth. But five years later, he was actually charged with her murder. And the jury found him not guilty because there was no sign of a struggle in the hotel room. So Robert and his wife are divorced. And no, but guess what did work out? My Google searching. I spent like an hour and a half two hours trying to find this guy and i found his linkedin i put a picture of him he he's changed his name so it was like really tough to find this guy but i was so happy when i found him uh yeah he is still kind of in the same line of work uh just living living his life and you know he is an innocent man so you know what can you do Right, but an I understand, but like an accident happened. Let's say an accident a hundred percent happened. Call the police. Yeah, it was definitely ugh, slime bag negligence. Like it was bad. So we who can shake that story off and go to the fall of nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. Just like uh, Woodstock being over, I'm sure there are a bunch of little orphan babies popping up all over the place. Right. Well, no. The Glenn Dean Butterfield we meet, she, she gets to see her niece, Kellyanne, for the first time. Glenn Dean was born to a nun, not Kellyanne. No, no problem. It, just an interesting fun fact. Glenn Dean was born to a nun, and then she was actually placed for adoption and adopted at the age of three. But she gets to see her little, her brother's little daughter, Kellyanne, for the first time. And this is like a baby. Um, Okay, so we meet Glendine's brother. His name's Bob Ayers. He was in the military, and he was being shipped to Germany. Now, his baby mama, if that's what you want to call her, was also in the military. So they had nothing to do with his baby, like, the, who was going to raise this baby. So the Air Force was actually going to put her, the baby in, like, the Air Force orphanage to try and adopt her out. And Glendine, who's the aunt of the baby, said, no, my niece is not going to go to an orphanage. So she has this, like, hard-fought battle to gain custody of Kellyanne, and she does get it. So Kellyanne joins the family. You know, she's got two older sisters now, and everybody just dotes on her. And Bob Ayers was like, daughter, what daughter? I'm out of here. So, oh, no. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, she's she's raised by Glendine and Glendine's two daughters. And in 1974, Bob Ayers decides to show up again. And so he's like, I don't want anything to do with that daughter, but I will take an apartment that's in the same apartment complex as you guys have. So. Exactly. And now all of a sudden, this woman named Kitty shows up and she starts making eyes at Bob and Bob wants to play like he's a good dad because now he's got a, like a woman to impress. So after like two days of knowing Kitty, he moves in 
and straight up steals Kellyanne from Glendine's house. And he's like, you need to start calling me daddy and you need to start calling Kitty mommy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And at this point, Kelly Ann's like five or six. Like she's old enough to kind of know what's going on. And we get a little reenactment, little girl who is talking to Glendine because, you know, the police were able to get Kelly Ann back. So little reenactment, Kelly says, I just don't understand. Kitty wants me to call her mommy and Uncle Bob wants me to call him daddy. Like, and she's so sad. It's so sad. And she's like, come here. You're too sad to be a little girl on Christmas. That's Glendine. <laughs> so Bob actually sues Glendine for custody. And a judge talks to the daughter and he's like, what do you want? And she's like, I want to stay with Kit Glendine. So th she does stay with Glendine, but Kitty and Bob can have visitation with her. So Kitty and Bob are being like real gross about this whole custody thing. Whenever they see her, they're just like filling in her little head with crazy stuff of like, we are your real parents. Ugh. It's going to mess her up forever. Like what they're doing now. Um, so Glendine's like, I am getting my daughter, rightfully her daughter out of this situation. And so she moved to this little rural town in Nevada where Bob would only see her twice a year on his visitation. So whenever he would see her, Kelly Ann would come back so depressed. And Glendine's like, I can't keep arguing with Bob. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give Kelly Ann back to her birth mom, who is Marion Kelly, which feels so spiteful to me. Yeah. No, it is so selfish. And, oh, here you go. You have custody now. Why? The mom was never in her life. You know, like, what? You're just doing this to piss off your brother. Like, it's such a weird power struggle between Glendine and Bob. And Kellyanne is right in the middle. So, apparently, Mary and the mom had remarried. She had two sons. And so, Glendine says that that was, like, the more stable option for Kelly. But I don't buy that. So, Glendine goes to court and she transfers custody to the mom and she kisses little Kellyanne goodbye and ships her off to her new family. And we get to see little Kellyanne like crying at the window while Glendine just pieces out in her new car. Oh, it's so sad. So it's like Christmas 1976 and Glendine talks to Kellyanne on the phone. And it's the last time that she ever speaks with her because the next time she tries to call the line, it's actually disconnected. Uh, it's 1983 now. Glendine and Bob are buddies again because whatever issue they had, they squashed. And they decide it is their goal to, like, search for Kellyanne for the rest of their lives. So in 1994, Bob dies in what's described as a farm accident, but we don't hear any more details. Um, and we get an update, you know, <laughs> within minutes of the airing, a caller said that Kellyanne was actually in the military herself. She was stationed at Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska, and they were reunited. And, you know, she said, like, I can't wait for my kids to, to meet their grandma because you're my real mom, basically. And sadly, Glendine did die in 2015, but Kellyanne and Glendine stayed in contact until her death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's got some kids. I found her Facebook. She seems to be doing just fine. She's married. She's got she's still married and has the kids that she had when we had the update on Unsolved Mysteries in 97. A hundred percent. No, it was such a tug of war. I think all the adults had their egos making the decision. I don't think anybody really thought what was best for Kellyanne, but luckily she seems to be a well-adjusted woman, as much as you can judge from anybody's Facebook. <laughs> No, because then they're trying to find her together because they're friends because the only reason they weren't trying to find her is because they hated each other. Like, I, it was so gross. I didn't like it. I really didn't like this story. Same. Yeah, same.
Yeah, and I mean, I went on Glendine's Facebook because she has one, and she is so cute and so old. When she, um, I mean, obviously she's passed, but like, yeah, but she seems to have been like a mom to a lot of like wayward people. Like she's like kind of that cigarette smoky tough neighbor mom that would like always have a seat at their table available if you needed some food. Like that's kind of the vibe I got him off Glendine. Exactly. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, definitely. Ah, oh, but of course, absolutely my pleasure. <laughs>